minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show winding up uh, the week here on the Jeff Santos Show. I'm going to be talking with our good friend uh, Mark Taylor Canfield uh, momentarily as uh, we uh, uh, now have changed the channel. The Red Sox lose in uh, 11 innings to the Yankees, 6-5. to five. Um, It is what it is, folks. The Red Sox need some bullpen help. Um, We'll uh, be talking to uh, MTC momentarily. Uh, Looking forward to uh, conversing with him um, on uh, some of the big things uh, that are going on nationally, like uh, what's happening with Amazon and Starbucks. Just happens to be, of course, that those two, uh, those two particular companies are based and headquartered in the great city of Seattle. Of course, has nothing to do with the progressive elements of uh, that city. It means uh, sellout mayors allow them to go and go hog wild, you know, for uh, a few extra jobs. Um, and that's the sad uh, part of, you know, progressive cities, whether it's Boston or New York or, you know, San Francisco. And, you know, there, there are a lot of corporate behemoths in these big cities. And, you know, they follow, you know, well-educated by population. And you know, that's just the way it is, right? But, you know, sometimes you got to lay down the law, and um, that is an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, you know, there, there is a, I think, a frustration um, by a lot of us on the progressive side that we can't seem to uh, get out of our way um, when it comes to, you know, getting the message out in the Democratic Party. We just talked about that with Joe Sandberg. And again, it's Living Wage Act, A-C-T, com. Uh, if you want to get involved and help Joe on the $18 minimum wage, which hopefully we'll get our way to Seattle. And, uh, and of course, SeaTac, which was the first uh, community in the country just outside of Seattle to uh, to have a fifteen dollar minimum wage. So maybe get it first in California, and then to SeaTac and, and around the country. All right, we are joined uh, by our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield. He is, of course, the executive director of Democracy Watch News, a great reporter, uh, a great musician, and of course the Renaissance man of the Jeff Santos Show. We go live to the two hundred six live to Seattle, WA. And we say hello, Mr. Mark Taylor Canfield. Hey, Jeff, you know, I, I should welcome you. Friday. <laughs> happy Friday, man. Happy Friday. Well, you know, I, oh, wow. I'm thinking maybe I should um, introduce you as young Jimi Hendrix, um, you know, because you're sounding more and more like him every day, man. Well, he is definitely my major influence when it comes to music. Um, growing up in Seattle, I can't avoid the spirit of Jimmy. He's everywhere. Every band I've ever played in wants to cover Jimmy. And uh, But today started kind of chaotically because I was in the studio, and my neighbors uh, uh, to this, next to the studio have a business, and they have a cat. I have a couple of them, actually. And one of the cats got into the studio. I didn't know that one of the guys let him in. So they knocked over a cup of coffee all over a bunch of my keyboards. I'm like, what? I, this is crazy. The cats are worse than the band. I mean, I'm like, I have to watch them all the time. Now I have to watch the cat. <laughs> but but we had this. You got you got to get a babysitter, yesterday. man. That's what I think you do. You need a babysitter uh, for the, the band cat's name is and Shadow. The cat. It's black and it <laughs> hides behind things, and so you don't you don't even know it's there. But yesterday. Jeff, we had a beautiful day. That's why everything that happens today is just fine. Because yesterday, 73 degrees. What an incredible day in Seattle. Everybody was out on the water kayaking. There were even people swimming. It was incredible. Now today, we're back to 52 degrees and rain. And it's going to be that way for the next week. Low 40, or actually upper 40s this weekend. So even though the entire city of Seattle had a spring breakout session yesterday where everybody was out in their shorts jogging and biking by the way according to the national chamber of commerce i guess seattle has like one of the most healthy and and active populations in the country um, along with san francisco and uh denver and a couple other places but yeah everybody was out everybody was wearing their shorts jogging everybody was bicycling or whatever kind of electric device they have to get out um people were on the water everywhere now everybody's hiding again because it's back to gray skies. 
It's going to be like 48 degrees tomorrow and on Sunday, oh, right. and nobody's going to want to go out. So there we go. Yeah. You know, I'm wondering, you guys, uh, and talking about Seattle, Washington area, and the Puget Sound, is it springtime, like, late May, early June, cloud cover leaves, sun comes out, bumper shoot, all the outdoor You festivals? never know. Or is it later than that? Because sometimes we get the same situation. We've got June and it's like, you know, 55 degrees and nobody wants to go outside because it's too cold, even though the beach houses in the Cape Cod area and other places. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, about that because I know in July, August, September, it's just fantastic. But It's actually snowed here in April when I was a kid. It didn't snow much, uh-huh. but it got cold. So it's a crapshoot, Jeff. We have fall springs. Uh, all the crocuses and the daffodils are blooming. The cherry trees are going crazy at the University of Washington, one of the most beautiful places you've ever been in the in the springtime. The, the Washington Arboretum on Lake Washington, incredible when everything's blooming. But the weather doesn't necessarily stay warm. You'll get, like, one really great day in April of 75 degrees, and everybody's out in the water, and everybody's out boating. And then for the next three weeks, it's rainy, cloudy, gray skies. And unfortunately, I just had a a musician that I was working with decide that they're going back to Florida because I can't stand the gray skies here in Seattle. It's just something you got to get used to. When the sun finally comes out here, it is the most beautiful place I've ever been, Jeff. The mountains, oh my God, the the ocean, the Puget Sound, it's so gorgeous. But during these long, gray winter months, that spread into spring so the whole month of march felt like november yeah it was rainy and cold yeah, that's and the miserable. way it is always here in boston march is i think the worst month because you know you expect january february and december to be like that we don't expect march and you know just uh you know seven eight hours south of boston is dc and it's already 70 degrees and sunny in dc as, as an example so it's really bad hey you know yeah, i we were talking in seattle you- in Seattle, you can't tell what season it is because you can't see where the sun is at on the horizon because it's totally cloudy. You don't even know where the sun's at. The trees, no, most of the trees are not deciduous trees. They're evergreen trees, so they don't change. The weather could be 52 degrees and raining and miserable in March or April, or it could be in the middle of June or November. You don't know. It's really hard to tell what the seasons are here, except when the sun finally comes out and it gets really beautiful, or on those rare occasions like it has in the last few years where it actually snows here. But otherwise... I don't know what month it is. I have no idea. It's gray skies. It's the same most of the year. <laughs> it's know? Seattle, not in the summertime anyways. Well, let me ask right. you, um, I, uh, we've been talking a lot um, about the victory for uh, the Amazon workers in Staten Island and uh, the, the facts that it was done by young people um, and a lot of progressive union folks who didn't rely on Washington, D.C. for orders from headquarters kind of thing. Uh, you know, the AFL-CIO wasn't involved, neither was the SEIU, although they they have people around. Unite Here, I guess, was was involved just by lending the offices to Christian Smalls and, and others. But they, they did it on their own. And, of course, also similar situations with Starbucks workers, although SEIU has got more involvement there. Two things. The two companies that I mentioned happen to be headquartered in your great city of Seattle. And, again, it has nothing to do with the great progressives and Ms. Sawant and Jayapal and what you do and all the other progressives in that great city. But it is interesting that they both got their headquarters, you know, in the heart of uh, of Seattle. And I, I'm wondering, you know, when you hear these news, uh, the news of more unionization in Starbucks, uh, you know, of what happened in Staten Island, you know, do Seattle activists say, hey, what about here? You know, what about us getting a union? What What about us, you know, getting, I mean, is it changing or are, you, are is there still, you know, another, another shoe to drop here to get more organized folks at those two particular companies in uh, the 206? Well, there's a great article today at Truth Out by Sharon Zhang, who uh, is a Truth Out is a place that I write at quite a bit. And Sharon did a great job of talking about what's happening in Seattle. Um, it's ironic that the first unionized Starbucks were actually in Buffalo, New York, not in Seattle, yeah. Washington. Yeah, yeah. But there is a pushback from the corporate headquarters here. There recently, apparently, has been a pivot on the part of Howard Schultz, the billionaire who ran for president not too long ago, who owns or was the owner of Starbucks, he and some other folks are now starting to to speak more about the workers as if they're real people and actually deserve 
you know, a decent wage and decent working conditions. But it, you know, as far as Starbucks is concerned, uh, we it's it's amazing because Starbucks workers just hit a milestone of 200 stores filing to unionize. That doesn't mean that they've all unionized. It means that those the workers in those stores have filed to unionize. They they've made it known publicly that they want to unionize. And the first 100 stores. Um, took about 172 days for that to happen for those filings. And then the second hundred only took 48. So this is a snowball effect that's rolling fast across the country. And um, stores are now filing at an average of more than two a day. Two Starbucks stores a day are filing to unionize. And um, they've filed to unionize in over 30 states. And it covers over 5,000 workers across the country. So this is a big issue. So... I would suggest that, you know, the, the progressive politicians and anybody who wants to be known as um, standing up for working families needs to get behind this now because like legalization of cannabis and like uh, marriage equality and so many other issues, it is just got legs and it's not going to stop. It's not going to go away. It's going to roll across the country. And I would suggest that the stockholders and CEO at Starbucks get used to the idea um Firing labor organizers is just going to backfire on the company. It's going to make them look worse, and it's going to want. It's going to cause more workers to want to unionize. So, as I always say, you know, to the business people who go after Shamla Sawant, sometimes it's best just not to be an adversary because you give so much more energy to the other side and so much support to the other side. So, you know, it's going to happen. There's no way that the company is going to stop it. These um, baristas and workers want a decent wage. They want to be able to afford to live in the cities where they work, where the rents are high in these major cities. They want to have a future beyond, you know, working a a minimum wage job that keeps them poor the rest of their lives. So who can blame them? I certainly don't. I totally support them. And so does the city of Seattle. It's the corporate people. The city, when I say the city of Seattle, I mean most of the people who work here, most of the people who live here, and our city officials, including our city council, are totally supportive of these kinds of organization organizing efforts by Amazon and Starbucks. But the corporate people here are the ones who put up the roadblocks and try to stop it. So there you go. They pull these strings, you know, at the top levels of government, like in the mayor's office, and the next thing you know, they've got a candidate dancing to their tune. And we've yeah, seen that yeah. over and, and over dance, again. Uh, like a little puppet. Uh, talking with our great friend MTC here. Open up the phone lines a couple of seconds. Go to John in Minneapolis at 772-223-2362. So let me, let me ask you about Sawant. When, when she sees these headlines in New York, uh, is she putting out press releases saying, what's going on here? What can't, why can't we do this with Amazon, with Starbucks? I mean, are there, are the progressive leaders that we're so uh, fond of uh, here on the East Coast when you talk about uh, the city council? and so forth and how many times she's had to take on and beat back the likes of Amazon um, and so forth and Bezos. What is she saying? What is Jayapal saying, if anything? Uh, They're both saying that they support the workers and they've both been very clear about that. And if it was up to Pramila Jayapal and Shama Sawant, uh, this would have been a done deal a long time ago. And all all workers... I think we lost uh, our good friend, uh, Mr. Mark Taylor Canfield. Hopefully we'll get him uh, back uh, momentarily. Uh, again, folks, uh, talking with MTC, uh, you can uh, check out RevolutionRadioNetwork.com. And, of course, uh, you can go ahead uh, and listen to the podcast there beginning in about uh, 45 minutes or so at 630 uh, Eastern time. Uh, you can uh, go ahead and do uh, just that. Um, one thing. As we uh, try to reconnect with our good friend uh, MTC, uh, and hopefully his cell phone it did not die. Uh, that it's just uh, just a bad cell zone. Um, I'm hoping because we love to talk to Mark before we go back off the air in another uh, ten minutes or so. But here is, you know, the view. I think um, there are progressive cities. That, you know, that, again, as Mark says, have political figures in them that will do the bidding of their corporations. 
And I don't think Sawant and, and Jayapal are in this case, but there are a lot of others, as Mark was pointing out. The mayor will, you know, will give everything, you know, for votes and for campaign da- cash uh, to win his or her seat. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, you have these progressive companies in uh, well, progressive, but these companies in progressive cities and like Seattle, like New York, like San Francisco uh, and so forth. And that's that's the sad part of this. And it's really, really frustrating to uh, to see that all. And uh, again, hopefully we can be rejoined here by uh, MTC momentarily. Um, and uh, hopefully that is the, the opportunity to do uh, to do just that. Um, all right, let's go up to uh, Minneapolis, and uh, hopefully as we uh, talk with John here um, from the uh, great Twin Cities, we'll, we'll have our friend uh, Mr. MTC get back to us. Um, you know, uh, John, it is, um, it is frustrating, uh, you know, to see a progressive city um, you know, not have uh, laborized, uh, you know, labor unions in in Seattle, where where Amazon is from, or or even even Starbucks. But you know, those are those are some things. I presume similar situations, you know, in in Minnesota. I think you have United Healthcare in 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 the great state, right? Oh yeah, United Healthcare is uh, you know a kind of an ominous force here. In the, yeah, in, the in an otherwise progressive I mean, I state. Yeah. yeah, because uh, actually the DSL party, the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, kept them really uh, contained and out of the marketplace in in Minnesota. Ironically, they were everywhere else, but not here, uh, because uh, their for-profit uh, model, and uh, we uh, didn't allow for-profit uh, HMOs and whatnot for years, and then they cornered the, they forced the hand of the, uh, of our governor, and were, and that was opened up again, so, um, but they're, they're into a lot of other things, like, for instance, they do the, the computer, uh, you know, charting, they own companies that do computer charting, uh, for hospitals, uh, they also, you know, like the, when I was still working, uh, they were the ones that administered the plan that I had. So they had their hand in that, and they had their hand in the till of the quote nonprofit oh, yeah. company, healthcare <laughs> company that I worked for. So yeah, I, you know, it's, it's unbelievable how it yeah, ha- how they, it happens there, uh, yeah. uh, John. I want to yeah. bring in our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield, who's rejoined yeah. us here. Uh, uh, to uh, to add to this too, uh, Mark, uh, thank you for getting back to us. Um, you know, I think John is is right. You know, they, these these big companies find ways, you know, around the political laws, find ways to sort of manipulate it, um, as they did in Minneapolis. And you know, this is this is the reality of today. No matter how progressive, you know, the cities are, and this is this is what indeed happens. Yeah, Mark? The, you know. Yeah, Seattle has become has become um, a corporate town, and so unfortunately, it's hard to get um, make progress on some of these progressive issues, and and then keep moving in the right direction. Uh, not just with things like healthcare and unionization, but we also uh, are the city of Seattle looking for a new police chief, which is something that I know John uh, thinks a lot about in terms of policing there in Minneapolis. And we have uh, a current uh, police chief, a, a, um, Adrian Diaz, um, who will be in the running as, as a permanent police chief, but he's just interim um, since Carmen Best resigned. And I'm a little bit worried that, that those corporate conservative points of view are also going to influence the mayor on the choice of a new police chief and that we may end up getting someone who's kind of a... Uh, let's say somebody who's not as responsive to the community as we would like to see. So I hope that doesn't happen. I, I would like to see cities like Minneapolis and Seattle lead the way and show the rest of the country how progressive politics works and how grassroots organization uh, works so that you can actually get things done on a local level um, through democratic processes. I mean, it can be done in cities like Minneapolis and Seattle. I don't know about... Um, on the national level, that's still a struggle, but at least on the local level, we should really be fighting these progressive causes and not backing down to the corporate pressure 
because the, you know those corporations they need us they need us as workers and there are a lot of labor shortages our ferry system has a labor shortage alaska airlines is canceling all sorts of flights today because they don't have enough pilots so these corporations need to realize that employees are uh, very valuable and they need to be treated uh with respect uh otherwise people are just going to keep quitting their jobs i mean yeah. that's what's going on here i don't know what's no, happening no in minneapolis but uh, well, just, just quickly, John, because we're running out of uh, uh, time here, uh, yeah. is what is happening uh, in Minneapolis, is, is it a lack of political leadership? The mayor who's not, you know, exactly uh, on the cutting edge of progressive issues, a kind of sort of a sellout. Um, you have, um, you know, you've obviously lost a great leader in Paul Wellstone a few years back. Um, you know, what is, what is it from your perspective there? Well, the the the, uh, the city council was very powerful here, but it has its wings have been clipped by a ballot initiative that actually makes the the mayor more powerful, oh, wow. and the police department, you know, it it's um it has like unlimited power, and I I don't know I you know it's hard to describe it really shortly, but uh, you know they. Uh, run the union and they run the supervisory staff and they basically push every uh, anybody that's going to make changes like uh you know the the head of the police department the police chief they push them out it's just a revolving door of police chiefs police chiefs and uh, you know we that's had uh, like for instance Bob Kroll he was a white supremacist neo nazi he was the head of the police union i i mean you know, they, there's no change. Uh, they, yeah, they, well, you need change. You know, and, they and did that, a no-knock warrant. Yeah, no, you, 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 you mentioned that earlier. You know, you're you're, you're yeah. so right yeah. on what yeah. happened uh, to uh, to Mr. Locke. Uh, hey, uh, John, thank you, my friend. It's uh, at the yeah. end of the uh, yeah. uh, segment here. Appreciate you, uh, and have a great yeah. weekend. Um, uh, Mark, let me uh, let me just turn you, um, you know, to a little bit lighter uh, scenario here in the final two minutes. Uh, a, uh, baseball season opened today. My Red Sox tragically lost 6-5 uh, to five in the Yankees in 11 innings, but uh, Seattle Mariners look like they could make the playoffs this year, huh? This could be mind-blowing. Now that, you know, uh, the other uh, teams in town will be looking at the Mariners and, and looking at their prospects, that's a new thing for Seattle. It's like a, a renaissance in this town. Never before in my lifetime, <laughs> at least. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe once. Yeah, one you're going to go back to 2001. So you were you were a young man if yeah. if, uh, if you were even in Seattle. Yeah, I barely remember. It's like, yeah, I think we had a good team <laughs> one time. I, I've heard about it. I've seen the documentaries. But, yeah, no, we've had some really great players. Our, my complaint is always, you know, they end up going to New York, <laughs> New York Yankees. We're like a farm team for them. But I hope that, you know, the folks um, that own the team, uh, which includes, includes Nintendo, um, can come up with the money um, to really give us a good team and try to go out, go, I'm not saying Steinbrenner style where you just buy the best team, but, you know, using our resources and our farm teams, I would really like to see Seattle be a big contender. Um, and then, you know, because I don't know what's happening with the Seahawks at this point. Nobody really does. It's a real... Well, real you lost, you lost your great quarterback, team. Russell Wilson, and yeah. that, that's not a good thing. I'm so sad hey. about that, Jeff. I'm yeah. still crying to my beer about that or my coffee yeah, or whatever. It's, it's a, yeah, um, well, yeah, your great coffee. Um, that uh, is Seattle coffee, and I'm not talking about Seattle's best or Starbucks, of course, but just the local stuff that's there. Yeah, hey, uh, just finger, uh, man. Yeah, Franchise exactly, and, and a great guy. Yeah. You know, they, they, they could have paid yeah. less if they went to back Big to Green Bay, where he grew up in, in Wisconsin. Hey, uh, Hawkins, the great uh, drummer from Foo Fighters, Die, and, and, and Grohl is playing uh, drum again. You know, is he going to be uh, Phil Collins all over again? You know, I mean, that when when Collins was on his own after Genesis, he did you know a lot of the lead singing from the from the you know the drum set. Is it going to happen I again? I saw you think? Phil Collins live. Yeah, I saw him live in Seattle, and he started by singing. And had another drummer, but at one point he he went up on the riser and started playing drums himself. So maybe we'll see Dave Grohl doing that. He's always been a great drummer. He really helps right. fuel uh, Nirvana. Well, Nirvana. So you know that yeah. the power behind that kind of music is very intense, and we know he has it. So we'll see. He, I, I I look to him to do something like Phil Collins, where you know he might play on a few songs and then just do vocals and play guitar for the rest of the music. By the way, my friends in the Black Lounge have new singles coming out on Sub Pop, that iconic label in Seattle that launched a lot of those grunge bands. So go out and buy it, folks. The Black Tones have new singles coming out on Sub Pop. It's a great, great label and a great band. Thanks, hey, Jeff. thanks, have man. A great weekend. 
Hey, you too, man. All the best. We'll talk to you next Friday. Uh, I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. Uh, thank you all for great calls today. Uh, again, check out Revolution Radio Network coming up at 630. Uh, I want to uh, tell people, keep on fighting, folks, peacefully. Have yourself a great weekend. Enjoy it. My name is Jeff Santos, and right now it is my time to say I gotta go.